So we read in Genesis 3, obviously, the fall of man and the sin and how man left, was kicked out of the paradise of God um, and made to till the ground. And the woman was to bear children in sorrow uh, in her conception. Now, the title of my sermon this morning, I talked about hell last week, the truth about hell. Um, I don't really hear many sermons talking about heaven. Often people ask the question, what is heaven like? So I thought today I would share some truths about heaven. The truth about heaven. Um, because life, why am, I, why am I preaching on this this morning? Why did I even think to preach on this? Because life is hard, isn't it? Life's not easy. You, know, you work hard. Um, you know, you, you're always running out of time. You know, life is short. Um, there's a lot of suffering in this world. So I thought today uh, we want to reflect on the positive of life and what we can look forward to um, because life isn't easy. And you know, God has made it this way. We saw in Genesis 3, this is why we started in Genesis 3, life is not meant to be easy. Genesis 3, we saw here, unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So we see the two curses that are pronounced to the woman and to the man. And here, I often wonder, you know, because obviously they were giving birth to children uh, prior to the fall, right? And you just wonder, like, what was giving birth like prior to the fall? If giving birth to children now is, like, painful and really difficult. I mean, my, my guess is, you know, it probably took some effort to give birth to a child, but maybe it didn't, wasn't as painful, didn't require as much effort. And maybe this is why God says he will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Because maybe there was already a bit of effort, you know, required to give birth to a child prior to the fall. And what he did is he made it painful and he made it very difficult. And not only that, you know, childbearing is difficult and raising children is difficult as well. So in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. But not only this, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So this is interesting that the husband being the head of the home and the wife being ruled over by the husband is actually part of the fall. So what it makes me wonder is, you know, what was the marriage relationship like prior to the fall? You know, prior to, you know, Eve being deceived and then requiring an authority over her. And likewise with the angels, because you read in 1 Corinthians, it says this for this cause, a woman ought to have power on her head because of the angels. So because of Satan deceiving Eve and because women being deceived by angels in the past, this is why this structure is here. So because of our sinful nature and because of the fall, this is why this, the structure is the way it is. But it makes you wonder, what was it like prior to that? What was the marriage relationship like prior? Uh, because in the new heaven and the new earth, we will no longer have this marriage relationship. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So the curse to the man was now the earth would need to be labored for and tilled, and the sweat of your face we would have to work. So this is why we have to work hard, and it's difficult to make a living. This is part of the curse, right? Now what I want you to notice here is, is there isn't really much to life if you boil it down to the two main categories, right? Women, bear children, guide the house, and take care of the kids. And what do men do? Men provide for the family. So I just wanted to start, this really has nothing to do with the sermon, but I just wanted to mention this in Genesis here. You see the two roles of husband and wife being alluded to, right? One, the woman was raising children. The other man was tilling the ground and providing for his family. And then when the curse happened, it just made it a lot more difficult, right? Life was made to be hard from that point onwards. 
But notice, those are the two general responsibilities. But you know, when you tell a woman these days, hey, you bear children, you guide the house, people have this idea in their mind, like you're just stopping them from doing things that matter. You know, stopping them from pursuing this and pursuing that. And, they, and people get this idea, oh, men, they are just allowed to do whatever they want. But women, ah, oh, we have to stay home and take care of the children. But what I want you to realize today is, in this passage, is that's not the case. You know, men, the reason why men do whatever they want is because they're doing that to make a living. Right? If they're doing it just as a hobby or a recreation, I mean, there's nothing, is there anything stopping a woman from, from doing recreation? You know, you know, obviously men can take the kids out for a couple of days and the women can enjoy things. It doesn't stop families from going on holidays and things like that. You know, so the reason why men are, quote unquote, doing whatever they want is because they're trying to make a living. If they're not doing it for a living, then they're just doing it for a hobby. And if a woman doesn't need to go work for, for a living, you know, then, it's, then they, she raises the children. So you need to understand that there are two main areas of responsibility. Raising the children and providing for the children. And that multitude of activity, you think, oh, guys, just have, they can just have a, lead such a fulfilling life, you know, working for this corporation, being a CEO of this. I mean, let, let me ask you, if you reflect on the things that your company does, is it really that fulfilling? You know, think about the product or the service that your company provides. I mean, my company provides stationery. Big whoop. Yeah. Right? So it's like, oh, so would I rather say at the end of my life, oh, I led this company, had created pencils, sold stationery, you know, revolutionized, you know, the distribution, whatever. When at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, you're making li life easier here on this earth, but... Is that any more fulfilling? Is that, is that, should, you know, people who, generally people when they go to work, they have a greater purpose than whatever that company does, right? Because they work for that company just to make a living. They provide that good or that service just to make money. Why? For other things. Because you know what? Most people, if they had the money that their job provided for them, they wouldn't do that work. They'd do something else. So it's not that, no, don't get this idea in your head that, oh, the men can just live, like, like, the, like the left and the feminists will tell you, well, men can do anything. They can aspire to be whatever they want. But you know generally what, they're, that what they should be doing, what every man should be doing, is being a provider. It doesn't matter how they do it. They're just providing for their house. And women, because women give birth and they have the breasts, right? They have the, the equipment to take care of the children. That's why they take care of the home. So you, you notice how life is just geared around that, about raising godly children. So women take care of the home and men provide. So don't get this idea in your head that men just can aspire to be everything while women are chained at home. Because most men would not want to work their job. And most men feel chained to their job. Just like you women feel chained at home. You think, you think men can just, you can just leave your job whenever you want and start over again? No, because when, when you start over, those of you who know about careers, you've got to start from the bottom and you've got to think about your finances and things like that. So oftentimes people get stuck in a job and they can't really change. And like the Bible says here, you know, this sweat of your face, you've got to eat your bread and make a living. So just wanted to, to, to pause on that point there, but really has nothing to do with the sermon, but I just thought it was interesting there that you have the two areas of responsibility. So why, why is life so hard? Why did God make life so hard? You know, you're living your day, maybe you come here this, this today, and you're like, man, my week, just nothing's going right. I gotta work so hard, it's so hard to make a living, got all these debts to pay, and health problems, and all this sort of stuff, and you're just like, man, why does life have to be so difficult? And the reason why I think life is difficult is because God doesn't want you to love this world. You know, because you know what? If life was easy and life was pleasant and you just had it all together, how often do you think you'd think about God? I mean, we've got life pretty good now. Right? I mean, we complain about how hard, how hard life is. I mean, I don't think we've experienced anything compared to real suffering, real persecution real lack of food, real, you know, the living conditions of the majority of people in this world is nothing that we experience. But, you know, that's, that's not to downplay that people have troubles in their life, but the reason why I think God has made it this way 
is because he wants you to set your affections on things above. Look at Colossians 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection. What's your affection? Your love. The things you're passionate about. The things you think about. He wants you to set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. And you know what? If life was so easy and prosperous and everything went well all the time, 100% of the time, I think a lot of us would struggle to set our affections on things above. Because you know what? You struggle already with the struggles you have. Right? So thank God for suffering in our lives. And thank God God did this to make us think about the things that actually matter, the things of heaven. For you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Look at this. When Christ who is our life. See, what is your life about? You think, this is what I'm going to use my life for? The Bible says Christ is our life. He ought to be the reason why we live, we breathe, we do what we do. Because that's all that matters in this world. And this is why I want to talk about heaven today, because there's going to be a plenty of time, guys, to enjoy life later. Don't get caught up in the riches and the cares and the pleasures of this life there's going to be plenty of time for that afterwards. You know, sometimes I talk to people about that with marriage. You know, sometimes you want to do things before you get married, right? And I say, look, if you can just hold off, you know, hold off on the dates, hold off on the going to the Blue Mountains for a bushwalk together, hold off on the, you know, we, we got to travel into state, see Melbourne together, whatever. It's got, there's going to be plenty of time, there's plenty of time for that in your honeymoon and stuff afterwards, right? To the point where you'll be in routine before you know it. But think about that with life. Life is like that too. You think, oh, I'm running out of time to see this and see that and see that. And I say to you guys, there'll be plenty of time for that after death. Plenty of time to enjoy life, to see the things that you wanted to see, very better things than things now, you know? But remember, we have a thousand year reign on this earth. So the things that you didn't get to see before are probably still going to be there. Yeah. See afterwards. You know, maybe it might have a, a bit of fire hailstorm damage, you know, from the from the wrath, but you know, I'm sure some stuff will still be there to see. Plenty of time afterwards. So we need to set our affections on things above. First thing I want to talk about is so I want to talk about heaven this morning, the truth about heaven. So what is heaven? Heaven is God's throne, isn't it? Now, the word heaven in the Bible is used different ways, right? So when we generally think about heaven, we're thinking about that spiritual, supernatural place where God lives, right? Where his throne is, where, where that's imagined, uh, where, where, where we uh, talk about that. But the word heaven in the Bible is also used to describe the sky and space. So I just want to show you that in Genesis 1. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven. So you think about the stars, the sun, the moon, they're in space, aren't they? Of the heaven, to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. So notice the firmament. If you're wondering what the firmament is, what I believe it is, it's like, you know, yeah, you have matter and space. So God made the earth, he made matter, but then he also made space, which is the firmament. And this is why the firmament of heaven, that's what we think about the heaven, is the space and the sky. To divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven. So you see heaven there. To give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. Greater light to rule the day. And the lesser night to rule the night. He made the stars also. I always think it's funny that, you know, I guess if you believe. Some, not everyone believes stars are like these huge things, right? But if they are these huge things. I know, um, uh, oh, what's his name from Answers in Genesis? Ah, so I lost his name. Ken Ham, thank you. Ken Ham, he always says, he always makes a joke here to say, oh, he's making all this stuff, and then it's just like a footnote on the end. Oh, by the way, he made the stars as well. <laughs> just, there's millions of stars. <laughs> made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So we see that the heaven referred to in space, but obviously space is just an extension of the sky but but in the bible the heaven is talked about as the sky as well as space and god said let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that life and fowl that may fly so you notice how the the fowls of the air 
are made from water. Isn't that interesting? We're made from the dust of the earth, but the fowls of the air were made from the water. I don't know if you notice in this area, if you've been around here at night time, there's like a bunch of bats out here, like huge bats flying around. It's kind of freaky at night time because I came here on Friday night just to like clean up the storeroom and whatnot. And uh, yeah, there's these huge bats flying around. And I saw at least three or four of them at one time. So I don't know if there's some, uh, some cave here or some nest that they're all living in. Uh, but moving creature, found may fly above the earth. Look at this, in the open firmament of heaven. See, so where are the birds flying? In the firmament. So that's why I believe firmament is just the space. And then, you know, the Bible talks about first heaven, second heaven, third heaven. So I think that's referring to like heaven, sky, heaven, space. And then there's the, there's the phrase, the third heaven, which is God's throne, right? And this is what we see in 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12, we see Paul here describing that heaven is like unspeakable things when he went there. It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory or come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God know it. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. So a lot of people believe that this passage in 2 Corinthians 12, because if you don't know in Acts, in Acts, uh, Paul was actually stoned. And a lot of people believe he was actually stoned to death. And he saw God's throne. And then he came back to life. Right? And this is what he's describing here. He's like, he doesn't know. Whether, it's like he's saying, like, that was somebody else. He wasn't really sure. But he's like saying he's going to glory in that person that was caught up to the third heaven. So he's sort of referring to himself in third person. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise. So I don't know how people believe paradise is in the center of the earth and all that sort of stuff. Um, people believe Abraham's bosom is paradise. It's just this weird dispensational doctrine. But very clear in the Bible, the third heaven where God's throne is, that's, that's referred to as paradise. And heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory. Yet of myself, I will not glory, but in mine infirmity. So it sounds like when he got to heaven, he saw something, he heard things, and he wasn't allowed to speak them. Right? Kind of like in Revelation, when John was given some things, closed them up. Same with Daniel, I think, was given some things that he wasn't to reveal. Um, but it's not, that, it's not saying here that it, you can't talk about heaven, because obviously the Bible talks about heaven, so it's not that it's not lawful for man to utter words about heaven. Paul probably heard things, that he was not allowed to speak about. So we see here the third heaven. Heaven, the sky, heaven, space. The third heaven is what God, where God's throne is. Now we get a brief picture of the throne of God because we see it in Revelation and a few other passages. So I'll just read through uh, Revelation 4. See, after this I looked and behold a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. So you see in heaven there's a throne where God sits and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold. So you can get, start to get a picture of God's throne there where he has his throne and I guess, I don't know if it's like a, you know, seats sitting around but there's 24 elders sitting with him in a privileged position. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God. So it looks like there's some decorations going on in the throne as well. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion. The second beast was like a calf. And the third beast had a face like a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. So these are not angels. These are not cherubims, because cherubims have two wings. These are called the seraphims. We get their names from Isaiah, which I'll show you later. But seraphims are creatures that live in heaven, praising God on either side of God, or around in God's throne. And they were full of eyes within, and they rest, look at this, not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, 
holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So that's where the lyrics come from for the, lim, for the hymn, holy, holy, holy. So this is what these seraphim are saying in heaven. They're you know, flying, you know, and they're just saying day and night, holy, holy, holy to God, Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honour and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So we see here this, this picture in heaven, this majestic view you know, God sitting on his throne and being worshipped day and night, right? From these creatures, from the elders and surely people that are there in heaven at this moment as well. Now, how do we know that these creatures are seraphim? Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So Isaiah also gets a vision of, of the heavens of the throne of God in heaven. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. So this is how we know it's the same creatures, right? Because these six wings. One, uh, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. So you notice this is what they're doing with their six wings. And one cried unto another and said, look at this, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth, is full of his glory. Now, I don't believe these creatures are the same creatures in Ezekiel 1. Because I was like thinking, ah, I thought these creatures were the same creatures in Ezekiel 1 because you have the same face of a man, the lion, and the eagle, and was it the bear, I think? Ezekiel 1. But the reason why I think they're different because these creatures have four wings. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. So this is when Ezekiel now gets a vision of God's throne. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. So what does that mean, the likeness of a man? What I think it means, like the likeness of a man, is like when you're, the way we're upright. Uh, if you think about the way we are compared to the animal kingdom, no, no animals stand upright like we are. So if you think when people draw aliens and they draw them kind of like a man, it's kind of like you can think that's like the likeness of a man, even though maybe a different creature, standing on two legs, two arms, that sort of thing. So likeness of a man, everyone, look at this, had four faces. So if you notice, the seraphim, one had the face of one creature, one had the face of another. But these in Ezekiel, uh, sorry, it, remi it reminds me of this old Transformers cartoon. <laughs> there was this creature that had like different faces and the faces would turn. Um, so it sounds like it's like that, like there's a face on each side. That's why it says it's full of eyes. And this one actually has one face of each of these creatures but also four wings rather than six wings. So a bit of glimpse into God's throne, and that is heaven. Second is, now we spend eternity, we do not spend eternity in heaven. None of you know that. We do not spend eternity in heaven. Where do we spend eternity? We spend eternity on the new earth, right? Now, a lot of people, they may, they may not realize that. Or maybe you're thinking of the new earth as heaven, right? But there's a difference between heaven, where God's throne is, and obviously space in the sky, and the new earth, which is where we will spend eternity, which God will create for us. Revelation 20. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So after the thousand year reign, there's the great white throne judgment, and I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. So notice that we live, obviously there will be the end times events, then there will be the thousand year reign where we will reign on this earth in our new glorified bodies. Right? After that, there will be the great white throne judgment, you remember when Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. This is the moment where heaven and earth pass away. Right? Then in Revelation 21, we see, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. 
For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. Look at this. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. So what is different about the old heaven, or this heaven and earth, as opposed to the new heaven and new earth? So notice that God dwells separately from this heaven and earth. Right? So in this heaven and earth, God's throne is in heaven, his city is there, and then we live on this earth. We will reign here for a thousand years, then the white throne judgment, but on the new heaven and new earth, what changes? The city of God comes down from heaven and is now on the new earth as well, and we dwell together with God. God himself shall be with them. So that is a change in this earth as well uh, from the new earth, new heaven and new earth. So that's where we spend eternity. We don't spend eternity in heaven. So this idea like people get from the movies and from ads and whatnot, of people in heaven, you know, strumming their hearts for all eternity, sitting on clouds, you know, that's, I don't know, you know, we get a bit of a glimpse of what heaven is like now, but we don't spend eternity there. So why then on our gospel tract do we say how to know you are going to heaven? You know, why don't we make it say how to know you are going to the new earth? <laughs> I guess it just doesn't have the same ring to it, right? But also conceptually, I think people just understand, to, uh, you know, they, they go to heaven when they die. But this is not entirely inaccurate because if you were to die right now, where would you go? You would go to heaven, you know, or you would go to hell. So that's why the people that die now, they go to, they go to heaven, their soul goes to heaven immediately, right? And then at the resurrection, you're united with your body to reign on the earth for a thousand years. So that's why it's not entirely act, inact, it's not wrong to say, hey, if you were to die today, do you know you're going to heaven? Because that's where you will go. But just keep in mind, the nuance of it is, you know, you don't spend eternity in heaven. You spend eternity on the new earth. 2 Corinthians 5, how do we know that? Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. See, so as a believer, if you are absent from the body, you immediately go to be with the Lord. You're not, it's not this soul sleep. Right? Soul sleep is a doctrine of the Jehovah's Witnesses where they believe once you die, your soul is just dormant until the resurrection. No, the moment you breathe your last breath on earth as a believer, you will wake up in the presence of the Lord. Or as Lazarus did, he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. So I don't know if that's the case. He'd be like, oh, 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 <laughs> and uh, come to heaven. Luke 23, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, this is the thief on the cross, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom, I think this is one of the best proofs against soul sleep. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Right? Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. But you say, Oh, Jesus, didn't you die and go to hell for three days and three nights? How can you be in heaven at the same time? It still boggles my mind why believers ask that question. How can you be with Jesus in heaven? Didn't you know Jesus was in hell for three days and three nights? Or in paradise or whatever? How could he say to the thief on the cross, today thou shalt be with him? That's why the thief on the cross was in paradise where Jesus was. And you just think like, have we forgotten that Jesus is God? Have we forgotten that he can be everywhere? You know, he's in heaven as well as in hell. But that's why you can say, today thou shalt be with me in paradise because he's in heaven as well as in hell. That's why he said to Nicodemus, no man has sent it up to heaven except the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Because right? he was there as well while he was speaking to Nicodemus. So I don't know why people like, struggle, like use this verse at all to prove that Jesus is only in one location. Um, he can be everywhere. So that's why our gospel tract says heaven. So don't be, don't be uh, sort of unsettled by that. Because if you were to die at this very moment, it is a choice of heaven or hell. It's just that at the resurrection, thousand years on this earth, white throne judgment, heaven and earth pass away, and then the new heaven and new earth is where we will be for all eternity, and God will physically also be on that new earth as well to dwell with us, as opposed to in the heavens. Now, now where is God's throne now? I guess it's somewhere past the universe, right? Well, I don't know. The Bible says, as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than the, your ways. So 
you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that if you could travel to the ends of the universe, eventually you may, maybe you'll break through like a you know, ksh, you know, the space-time continuum and then you get into, into heaven and that's where God's throne is. I don't know how that works, but you know, maybe it's just a supernatural place where it, you know, like a different dimension. That's why they, you know, people, things can come from heaven into the earth. Who knows? But that's what God's throne is, so just keep that in mind. You know, we don't dwell eternity in God's throne. There's a difference between heaven and the new earth. Now, I want to spend the majority of my time, and you might say, Victor, you already spent a lot of time on the first few points. This is the majority of my time, and what will it be like? What will heaven be like? That's what I want to talk about today, mainly, is, um, you know, get us thinking about, ah, oh, man, what a perfect place it'll be. What will heaven be like? I got five things. One is, it'll be a sinless place, a place without sin. Revelation 21, and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Now, I don't know whether that means there will no longer be a sun and a moon. I don't know if God will recreate the sun and the moon, because who knows what the new heaven and earth will be like. But I, what I think this lamb lighting it, because the lamb is, you know, Jesus, the, the man, is going to physically be somewhere. But I think it's talking about this city that comes down from heaven. Because there will be the city of God, but there will also be cities around the world, right? Around the new earth, where people will be ruling and reigning, much like in today. But there will be a capital city of the world. And that's where Jesus will be ruling and reigning. Kind of like, you know, there isn't really one now. I guess the UN is trying to be, be that. Right? But, you know, there'll, there'll be one day, like a capital city. That's where Jesus will be. And what I think this is saying is, I don't think this is saying, this is my opinion. I don't think this is saying that there's no more sun or moon to sort of give us day and night and time. What I'm thinking is, it's like in that city, it's just saying there's no need for the sun because that city is always lit. So think about it like, you know, people will say like Vegas is the city that never dies. It's always lit. I sort of think of it like that. You'll go there and it's always day because Jesus is there. There's no night there. Um, you can go there obviously to worship the Lord and visit and all that sort of stuff, you know. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there and they shall bring the glory and honour of the nations into it. And they shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now notice this is Revelation 21. After the thousand year reign, after the white throne judgment, this is now on the new heaven and new earth. So this is where it's talking about this is the perfect place with no sin. But where people get a bit confused is... People think heaven, God's throne, is a place without sin. Now you say, well, heaven's a perfect place. Heaven's a place without sin. But you would be wrong, right? Because heaven does have sin in it, right? Because who can go to heaven? Satan, right? So that's why there are sinners. There are sinful creatures that are in heaven, right? Because heaven is just God's throne. But we, because we do not differentiate, between the new heaven or between the heaven and the new earth, we just have this picture that heaven is a sinless place. But we know that Satan goes in and out in heaven and earth. Job one, we'll just read two verses. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan, so this is in God's throne in the third heaven. Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth. And from walking up and down in it. So notice that Satan has free pass to go from heaven and earth as a sinful being, right? So notice that sinful beings are in God's throne, but they are not on the new heaven and new earth, which is what we think about heaven, right? The, the perfect place. Revelation 12. So what happens in Revelation 12? Satan's able to go back and forth. You think about the angels that sinned. Some of them can go back and forth as well. Some of them are already in hell, right? The ones in Genesis 6 that are reserved in chains under darkness until the judgment of the great day. Some of the angels are in hell already. But remember when Satan is 
you know, he draws the third part of heaven in Revelation because he's convinced some of the angels to follow him. And those are the demons and devils that we see roaming around on the earth, as Satan does. You know, he says, where were you? I'm roaming around the earth, right? So this is where his demons and devils are too. Look in Revelation 12, if you don't believe me that there's no sin in, um, that there's sin in heaven. And there was war in heaven. Look at this. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. So notice that there is a dispute in heaven. There is a war that goes on that triggers Satan from being cast out of heaven and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So you see heaven right now, the throne of God. It's not a perfect place. It's just God's throne where he rules and reigns. When we think of the perfect place, it's the new earth. I don't know if you never noticed this story in 1 Kings 22 with King Ahab. This is how Ahab dies, where he's tricked into going into battle, right? Because the prophet of God is telling him, don't go in. He gets this vision, this prophet, and he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left right so this is the host of heaven sure there's believers there as well maybe the right and the left are like the good and the bad you know uh, or the saved and the unsaved the lord said who shall persuade ahab that he may go up and fall at ramoth gilead so remember this god this is like in satan in job this is in god's throne and one said on this matter and another said on that matter so people are giving suggestions or spirits are giving suggestions. And there came forth the spirit, look at this, and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? So with what? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. You see, that spirit is in heaven, in God's throne. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him and prevail in also. I prevail also. Go forth and do so. So you see how... People wonder why. People say, you know, God, why does God, you know, we talk about why does God allow suffering? Or say, oh, you know, people say, well, if there's a loving God, why does God allow Satan to exist? You know, Satan's causing so much trouble, going around, deceiving people, doing this, doing that. Well, we get some insight into here why God allows Satan and his angels to exist. Because he, can use, he uses them for his purpose. I mean, this world is not perfect. He's trying to mold us, he's trying to teach us things. And we can see here, God can sometimes use Satan and the demons to test you, to build you up as a believer. He can bring judgment on unbelievers as well. Why are they out there deceiving? Because maybe God has given that person enough chances and now he's going to let them get deceived. Right? Maybe he's going to judge somebody for their sins as well. Right? If he's going to bring down chastisement, he can use satan to test people that's what we sort of see in job don't we god used these the, the sinfulness of these other creatures to do good he works all things for good so we see here that heaven is not necessarily a sinless place but the new earth is a sinless place now some people say things like when they think about heaven being a sinless place they go ah oh, well heaven must be so boring you know, like when, when you were younger, maybe you think like, oh, like, what fun things can there be to do on the new earth if there's no sin? As if, as if sin is the only thing fun in the earth to do. You know, and then you think about it, right? When you think about pleasure that comes from sin, there's really not that many things. You know, because the Christian life is not boring, guys. People think, oh, you know, I want to, they say like, I want to live the Christian life, but... Oh, I don't want to get up on Sunday mornings and uh, you know, like spending all this time serving as though that's not fun. You know, like, it, or like life doesn't have to be just a chore. You know, if, you're, if your Christian life is boring, you're not living it right. Because right? the Christian life is not meant to be boring. There are challenges to be done. There are children to be raised. When we talk about the purpose of life, I mean, a lot of people, you know, they, they put their life into their children, into their marriage and things like that. But... Like I said, if your Christian life is boring, it's probably because you're not doing it right. And likely you're half in and half out. 
And that's why you can't get the fun out of the world because, you know, you can't live like the rich and prosperous and like that. And, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But if you want to live a life that actually has lasting joy and has purpose and has fulfillment, you live a godly life. And you, I'll tell you what, that's not a life that is boring because a, a life that has purpose, a life that has meaning, a life that has eternal value is a life that's worth living. And you know what? The people that give themselves over to the pleasures of this life, they realize that. You know, and you don't need the rich of this world to teach you that. You could have just learn the lesson from Solomon. Solomon lived it up. He had all the money, the wealth, the women, the power. And what did he say? This is the conclusion. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. So you can learn that lesson now or you can learn it the hard way and waste your life living that sort of life and just realize what everyone else has realized that comes to the end of their rope. Even all those Hollywood stars that you idolize so much, even they come to the end of their rope thinking like, what was my life about? Who are even my friends? Who even cares about me? What have I got? I didn't have any kids, no kids to take care of me. You know, they realize these things are worthless. Because the pleasures of sin are just for a season. And think about, think about this. I want you to think through this. Because this is how I sort of console myself. I need to think through these things, right? To think, get my perspective right. What are the pleasures in this life that people do when they talk about, oh, you, you live the Christian life. It's no fun anymore. This is what they're talking about, guys. They're talking about sex and they're talking about drugs. You know, they're talking about maybe like gadgets and gizmos, fancy things, like going on holidays and whatnot. But think about it. Let's, let's, go, let's go through some of these, right? When you think about... I'm sort of getting ahead of myself. I'll skip over this for sake of time. Hebrews 11, pleasures of sin for a season, right? Sin only gives you temporary joy. But let's, let's talk about these three things, right? Number one is people say, oh, you know, when, when I live the Christian life, I'm going to give up, you know, can't just sleep around anymore and have any, any girl I want. But just remember, guys, like the ple think about this. Pleasures of sin for a season. And people realize this. When they sleep around and they spend all their life fornicating, they come to the end of their life and they realize there's no love in this. You know, because you can't build, you can't build that godly lasting relationship when you're just fornicating around and i think that's what people realize when they grow up and they grow out of that lifestyle that they really don't have anybody that actually loves them that is faithful to them because you need that trust to build faithfulness this is why the bible says you know, concerning the things wherever you wrote unto me it is good for a man not to touch a woman nevertheless to avoid fornication let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband Right, so when it comes to sex, sex, when it's in the confines of marriage, that's where it has lasting enjoyment, right? People that sleep around with this person and that person, eventually they, you know, just like anything in life, guys, the, the full soul loatheth the honeycomb. And you can only have sex so many times with so many people until it just becomes the same chore again and again. And this is why people that sleep with prostitutes, you know, people like men that sleep with prostitutes, they, real, they recognize eventually there's no relationship here. This woman doesn't even care. They start to desire those things because you realize the meaningless of just having sex with just people that don't care about you. Now, when we talk about the new earth and we talk about that desire of sex, I mean, that, is, that desire is not going to even exist anymore because a lot of our desires are going to change. So you know, like, hey, a lot of these things that I enjoy now, I may not even have that desire when I get to the new heaven. Look at what Jesus says in Mark 12. For when they shall rise from the dead, they shall neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. So a lot of our sexual desire is no longer going to be there in heaven. So we don't have to worry about it in heaven. I'm going to have this sexual desire I'm going to struggle with. And God has given us marriage in this earth in order to satisfy that sexual desire. And like I said, the godly life, it is way more enjoyable than the God, ungodly lifestyle of fornication. So when you think about the Christian life, when you think about you know, turning from sin and getting away from fornication, it's actually a good thing. It is a better thing. It's just people don't realize that yet because they haven't experienced it. 
So we're not missing out. You know, we don't miss out in the Christian life on that part of life. What about drugs? Talk about something where it's the pleasure of sin for a season. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And this is the verse I always think about when it comes to drugs and people living it up, alcohol and whatnot, because they live that lifestyle, they get addicted to that lifestyle, and it ruins their life. You know, you don't see the drug addict, you know, living healthy and happy. They've ruined it all. They've ruined their life. They've ruined their families. They've ruined their relationships. They're just trying to make money. A lot of women get into prostitution just to satisfy a drug problem. So you think we're missing out on life? You know, am I missing out on so many things because I'm a Christian, because I live a godly life? Get real. Psalm 104, look at this. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man that he may bring forth food out of the earth and wine that maketh glad the heart of man and oil to make his face to shine and bread which strengthens man's heart. So when we talk about those three things, sex, um, drugs, you know, people talk about having fun or just like general entertainment. Since when did being a Christian stop you from just, en just enjoying general entertainment? I mean, it's not a sin to enjoy things. You know, enjoy a you know, movie now and then, go on a holiday now and then. What, what's the problem? The problem is the type of stuff you're enjoying, right? The type of movie it is. The type of holiday. Having too many holidays. You know, living your life just in pleasure where you become unfruitful. Luke 8, and that which fell among thorns are they, which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, bring no fruit to perfection. So godliness is what gives lasting joy. You know, sin just causes a lot of suffering. And that's why in the new heaven and new earth, there's going to be pain and suffering put away. I had this verse in Ecclesiastes 5 that I won't read through, but this is just showing that, hey, if you love silver, you're not going to be satisfied with silver. You know, you strive in this earth to be satisfied with riches. It's not going to satisfy you. So you can learn this lesson from Solomon in Ecclesiastes, or you can spend your life serving vain things. All right, let's go on to the next one. So in Revelation, we know there's going to be no more pain, no more death, no more sorrow, no crying. It's going to be an awesome place, the new heaven and new earth, without sin. Because that's what sin causes. Sin causes a lot of suffering. And if you continue in sin, it'll cause a lot of problems in your life. These ones are not so long. Second one, it's going to be a place of great joy, isn't it? Isaiah 65. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem, a rejoicing, and her people a joy. Man, I can't wait. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed. So I think that's talking about hell. Um, if you're wondering what that means, I think what this means, it's not saying obviously there's going to be death in heaven, but I think the prophet there, Isaiah, is just sort of using the analogy of you know, right now we think of a child dying early as a few days, but because we're going to be living forever, if a child died at 100, if somebody died at 100 years old, 100 years old, they'd be, still be considered a child. That's what that um, phrase, I believe, is trying to say. And they shall build houses. So notice here, on this new heaven, on this new earth, we're going to be, there's going to be stuff to do. You see, so we're not just sitting around doing nothing. Like, we're building houses. And we're going to be dwelling somewhere and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards. See, I mean, oftentimes, like, people have thought one day, man, I wish I owned a farm. I wish I had some cattle or something. Yeah. I did that. You can do that in heaven. You know, how long would that take you? For some of us, it would take us hundreds of thousands of years. Sort that out. And others, maybe a bit, long, a bit shorter. Eat the fruit of them. 
They shall not build and another inhabit, they shall not plant and another eat. So it's like there's no war, it's peace, right? As the days of a tree are the days of my people and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. So notice it's a place where you're going to be worked. There's going to be projects to do, things to do. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. Isn't that great? So heaven is a place, or the new earth is a place, where you will have physical access to God. Right? Whereas now you need to call upon the Lord. You need to trust that he's hearing your prayers working there. On the new earth, you'll be able to go and visit him. See him face to face. What an amazing thought. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. So you see, even the animals are no longer killing each other. It seems like we may be vegetarians again, like in the Garden of Eden. That's why when I think of the new earth, I think of a restoration of the Garden of Eden. That's why we started in Genesis 3. We see what man lost and the new earth is going to be a restoration into the paradise of God with obviously a few differences. The dust shall be the serpent's meat. Maybe that will be a reminder, right, of, uh, of, of Satan. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. So you see how there are going to be dwelling places. We're going to be things to do. There's, we're going to be eating and drinking in heaven. That's why I don't, you know, I sometimes think, oh, I'd be nice to go here and go there and try the cuisine here and there. But I think that, that, that um, pleasure is not going to go away in heaven. Right, we're going to be able to travel and visit people, you know, visit Lewis's farm, try what he's growing there. And see, I mean, think about all the people you could meet, places you could go. There's going to be plenty of time for that. You don't need to do all that stuff now. You're going to be eating and drinking. Look, Jesus is going to eat and drink with us. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine. This is when he broke bread. Cup. Until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So one day you'll, you'll sit down and eat with Jesus. Fancy that. Right? You can have Jesus over for dinner. You know, there's plenty of time to do it, too. Pick his brain. Man, the questions. The conversation. Just imagine the conversation you could have. Um, now, sometimes people ask a question. I'll just throw this in here. They'll ask, like, would animals go to heaven? Well, I see my dog in heaven. Well, there are obviously animals in heaven. You say, well, like, will it be my dog in heaven? Who knows, but I know this. Look at what Matthew 7 says. Well, what man is there of you whom if son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? Serpent. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? So I don't think, think it would be too much of an ask if God can... You know, have that same creature live forever. You know, your old guinea pig, your old dog to, to dwell with you forever. You know, um, put it into a, a new body. Give him a new body. I don't know. But there are animals in heaven. Um, number three, heaven. I keep saying even, yeah, I keep saying it. New earth is going to be a place of rest. Matthew 8. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west. Look at this. And shall, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So we started this sermon talking about how life is hard, isn't it? Always out of energy. Working hard. But thank God, heaven, it's going to be a place of rest. It's going to be a place where you don't need to rush. You, have time, you all have all the time in the world. Right? You can sit down and you can rest. And look at this, you'll be in good company. You can sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Like we talked about having Jesus over, you know, maybe you can have Abraham over. You can have Isaac over. You can go see them. Think about all the believers throughout the time, throughout the ages that you can catch up with, you could talk with. You ever read the Bible and think, what was this guy thinking? We well, can go ask him. That's what heaven's going to be like. The new earth, the new earth is going to be like. The new earth is going to be great. It's going to be a place of rest. It's going to be a place of fellowship where you can sit down, you can eat, you can talk with people. It's a place where you'll see your loved ones again. First Thessalonians 4, I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. 
For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. And we know that passage ends with comfort one another with those words. It's a place of rest. No more struggle, right? It's a place of purposeful projects. We can sit, you can fellowship, and you can see your loved ones again. Obviously, your saved loved ones. That's why we need to get them saved. Number four, got two more. Number four is it's going to be a place with an authority structure. So a lot of people don't realize this, but on the new earth, not everyone is equal. There will be a difference in authority in the new earth. And the amount of authority that you are given in the new earth, it depends on what you do in this world. So that's why if you want to spend your life living in sin, you want to spend your life living for yourself, if you do, what are you going to have to show for it in heaven? In heaven, or the new, the new earth, the new earth, you'll be on the new earth a lot longer than you'll be on this earth. Right? So where do you want to spend your time investing? Right? Investing your time and your money. Matthew 5, look at this. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the, these least commandments and shall teach men so. Look at this. He shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So notice in the kingdom of heaven, there is least and there is great. Not everyone is equal. So what you are doing on this life right now is changing how you will spend all of eternity. You better think about that. I mean, a lot of you in here are wise enough to put money away for retirement, right? Thinking about, hey, the way I live now is going to change how I live in retirement. So use that same wisdom and think, hey, the way I live now, that's putting it up in my heavenly retirement. It's going to make a difference. Now, this is where we see the parable of the pounds as well. I'll just show here. In the parable of the pounds, every servant is given one pound. Ten servants given one each and how they multiplied it. And notice here when Jesus comes back and he tells his servants to give an account. Look at what he says. He says, then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. So you see how he multiplied it by ten. And he said unto him, well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little. Look at this. Have thou authority over ten cities. So you notice how where Jesus lives is one city. That's why I believe there's going to be cities all over the earth. And how faithful you are to God now with what he's given you is what you are going to be ruling and reigning over in the thousand year reign as well as into the new earth. And the second came saying, Thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou over five cities. So yeah, this life is not equal. This life is not just. Some people have it harder in this life than others. Granted, right? Some people are disabled. Some people are not. Some people have problems. Some people don't have. Some people are born into a richer family. Some people are not. But you know what? The new heaven and new earth are going to be. It's going to be a great equaling of the scales, right? Because everyone's going to be judged according to their productivity about what God has given them. And if they've been faithful and least, they will be ruling over much. And that's what we see here. Right? We see the multiplication. They were all given the same. One multiplied ten, ten cities. One multiplied five, five cities. But we see in the parable of the talents, the five gained five, and he was given the same reward as the two that gained two. You see? So we see a great equaling of the scales. But don't get this idea that on the new earth, everyone's going to be equal. No. It's better to be the least in the kingdom of heaven than to go to hell. But what you do on this life will change your place in that authority structure for all of eternity. Eternity, guys. So don't just enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season and give up what you could be enjoying for all of eternity. And that's my last point. The last point is that the new earth is going to be eternal. Eternal. A number that we cannot even fathom. It's going to go on forever. Think about today. How rushed everything is. Everything must be quick, right? 
got to get there, got to get back. You get frustrated when you're sitting in traffic. Yeah. You know, you've got only so much time to finish this project. Rush here, rush there. I've got to do this before I die, do this before I get too old. All that's going to be gone. You have plenty of time in the new earth. What a blessing. You have plenty of time. No rush, no end of life. You know, you have plenty of time to do any project you want. You know, and um, you know, it's gonna, not going to be sin, right? So it's going to be all great projects. A lot of people think, and I've, I've probably shared this with you before, a lot of people think, well, man, won't you get bored in heaven? You're going you're to get bored on the new earth. You know, what are you going to do day after day for all eternity? Are we just, people think, are we just going to be worshipping God for all eternity? Won't you get bored? I didn't even think that would get boring if you were there. But, you know, you don't. I think you probably visit God and go there to worship Him in the city and then you go and live your life. And I think it'll be very much, you know, similar to like how we're living now, just without sin. We have things to do. We have places we want to go see. But, you know, we, God is a part of our life too, you know, and things like that. But I'm sure, like I said, God who has created the heaven and the earth and how many things there are to see now and how many people there are to see now, I'm sure he can keep us entertained for all eternity. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Because, you know, we look at the world today and there is so much to enjoy. That you could spend multiple lifetimes just seeing this world. And this world is cursed. This world is fallen. You know, there are things on the new earth we don't even know could exist. You know, people say, like, this is, this, let's say everything you know is here. What about all the things you don't know? That could exist on the new earth. So I want to close on this thought. That remember that this life is temporary. This life is temporary. But the next life is eternal. So where are you going to live? Are you going to live for the now? Are you going to live for this life, which will at the most 80, 90, 100 years? Or are you going to live for the eternal? That's what I want you guys to look to today. You know, because we don't see that. We walk by faith. We see the pleasures that are in heaven and that joy forevermore in a distance. But the sermon today, I wanted to remind you of those things. So that you get that frame of mind of, look, it's not that big a deal if I miss out on something in this world. Because you know what? There's going to be plenty of time to enjoy life later on. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. I pray that you would help us to set our affections on things above, not on things of the earth. Lord, such an amazing place to look forward to. Not only the thousand-year reign where we'll be ruling and reigning with you, but the new heaven and new earth, a sinless place, all the time in the world, Lord, to fellowship, to enjoy, to sit down, not only with great men of the faith, not only with each other and our loved ones, but with you, Lord. Man, I look forward to that day where I'll be able to sit face to face and just have sweet fellowship. Uh, Lord, may we be faithful uh, in this world now so that we can look forward to spending eternity ruling and reigning with you. We thank you and we praise you. In your precious name, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.